seventh verse. It goes like this. But to each one of you, grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives, a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And he gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to all of us. And we need to be appreciative of those gifts. That's why we praise his name. Listen as Pastor Don sings, and we praise his name. These are the gifts Christ has given the churches, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, equipping the saints for the work of the service to build up the church in the name of Jesus. Preaching the good news and teaching of sound truths, correcting, encouraging, pastoring the people. These are the gifts Christ has given the churches, so follow. Where are the preachers and where are the teachers? Those called of God to be his servants. Where are the messengers who will carry the gospel from here to there and to the earth's far corners? There in the children's church, through the youth and through these pews, he'll search to find those he's calling to go make disciples. These are the gifts Christ has given the churches, so follow. Deep in God's glory we hear of the stories of those who've heard and answered God's call. None felt they were able to come to the table unqualified to be God's instruments of love. But that heart that is willing, God's spirit starts filling with power and wisdom and mercy and love. These are the gifts Christ has given the churches. So follow. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Don. First through sixth grade, feel free to go to your classes if you're still here with me. And if you've decided to keep a younger one with you today and they get a little bit anxious, if you take them to the back, we'd appreciate that. You can see today's service uh, on the screens in the back as well. First through sixth. Good morning. Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to worship in Main Place Christian Fellowship as I come closer to my end. Not the end, but my end. Making your end the beginning. It's been said by all of us at one time or another, all good things must come to an end, right? We've said that. After 30 years of starting churches and uh, training missionaries, I can say without a doubt, it's been good. It's been good. Not because I'm good, but because God has been good to me and given me good people. Amen. And so thank you. 
Yet I have more questions at my end than I did in my beginning. You see, contrary to other pastors, what I know about ministry, I learned in church. I started to write a book years ago titled, In Me There is a Ministry. I had learned my gift was not preaching. Joan had confirmed that Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. (laughs) But I had been given the gift of administration to be used in the ministry. Now, I thought the gift of administration is not very exciting. I mean, who really needs that? Until a little lady in our church said, Preacher, you get the gift to keep the church doors open. You got the gift to keep the church doors open. We've all received at least one gift. One gift, and those gifts are to keep the church doors open until the end. And the end is near. At my end and your beginning, I have a question. A question I've not been able to answer, or if I have answered it, I I don't like the answer. The question, could it be, could it be that the church has stayed open in spite of the fact that we have ignored God's commands and His plans? One more time. Could it be that the church in general, and this one specifically, has stayed open in spite of the fact that we have ignored God's plans and His commands? Now, living in Southern California, could could this be a Romans 828 theme park? Could, Could that be what it is that continues to get more expensive as we attract more people? You see, we've been moving from one model to the other, one model after another, just staying ahead, in my opinion, of the end. We've got a purpose-driven model. We got a seeker-sensitive model. We got a missionary model. We got a multi-site model. We got an invest and invite model. We got a pipeline portal and platform model. I mean, there is a new model every year coming our way. Could it be that we've kept the church open, ignoring God's great commission, His great plan for us. Matthew 28, 19, and 20 tells us to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've commanded you. Ask yourself, could we have ignored God's plan? Could we have ignored God's plan, His his platform and His precepts to, to build our own church and have gotten away with it? It's hard to believe that He worked all this out for good because we have loved Him and are called according to His purpose. It, it, It seems like we go after more people, not to make disciples, but to make money. Because more people means more money. More money means more buildings. More buildings means more staff. More staff requires more money. To get more money, we need to get more people. And then what? Could it be we just rinse, spin, and repeat that casual style? That cycle, without ever making a disciple? Now, the other extreme is we don't go at all. We don't go at all except to church. Either way, not making a disciple is the end. It's the end. Not the end of the world, certainly not that, but the end of our beginning. Enter Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus, a.k.a. Paul the Apostle, he felt the end was very near. So urgency to make disciples was embedded into his brain. As persecution smacked down on the church like Gallagher's sledgehammer on a red ripe watermelon, I mean splattering gospel seeds of salvation to the remotest parts of Asia Minor. You see, if the church isn't willing to go and make disciples, If they're willing to ignore God's commands and plans, they will be scattered. 
they will be scattered unwillingly to the remotest parts of the earth. That's God's time-tested method to reach a lost and dying world, making them disciples, or it's the end. That said, I titled today's sermon, The Big Three. The Big Three Church Builders. Take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, just two verses today, 11 and 12. Mark Warner is going to read aloud from the New American Standard Translation of the Bible. You read silently in whatever translation you have with you today. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 are off the screen as well. Let's all stand out of respect for the reading of God's Word as Mark reads aloud and you read silently Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Pastor Don, will you lead us in prayer? Father, how grateful we are for your word. You've asked us in the Old Testament, you asked everybody, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been Amen. You may be seated. Keep your Bibles open there to Ephesians as well as other passages that we're going to look at and then the outline if you want to follow along that way. Now, after I titled um, today's sermon, The Big Three Church Builders, I asked around. I asked around to several of you as to what comes to mind when you hear the phrase, the big three, the big three. Someone answered, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Someone else said, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, those are good answers, but when I hear the big three, I think Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler. Yeah, the big three automakers in America. Starting in the 1890s, with 97 other automakers in America, Henry Ford, William Durant, and Louis Chevrolet started mass production of cars in a hungry domestic market. They couldn't fill all the orders. And that was the end for 90% of those automakers. Then the assembly line was formed. And as long as your favorite color was black, you could get what car you wanted. They were available to you. Americans bought model after model after model. A subtle change here, a subtle change there, a Model A, a Model T, with or without lights, fenders were an option, bumpers an add-on, wooden wheels, rubber tires, a crank was standard, a rumble seat was a luxury. I mean, they were built to last, with no end in sight. Who couldn't wait but for the next model to come out? Soon there were imports, Volkswagens, BMWs, Mercedes, Imports that offered new models, automatic transmissions, front-wheel drive, but no longer built to last. We got gas and we got diesel and today's Teslas are all electric with one model after another. Now, some of you have never heard of the Etzel. Some of you have never heard of the K car or the Metropolitan. The Corvair and the Crown Victoria were in and out of production very quickly. I had a Mercury. Joan had a Renault. My buddy had DeSoto. All were replaced quickly with new models. 
just like the church has replaced one model with another model year after year. Think about it. We don't build them like we used to. Amen. Soon, no one will be sitting in cars or in church if it comes to the end. Now, my opinion, the big three church builders are evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I think of them as bodybuilders for Jesus, equipping the saints for the work of service, opening the doors to all kinds of ministry as they go. Now, the secret for success on Wall Street is what? Money. The secret for success in Washington, D.C. is what? Clout. The secret for success in Hollywood is what? Fame. The secret for success in church is service. The big three, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, are to equip us for the work of service. But my question is, have we done that or not done that, ignoring God's commands, precepts, rules, and plans? You see, in the 1960s and 70s, there was a flood of hippies coming to Jesus. Known as the movement, the Jesus movement. At the beginning of the movement was Chuck Smith, founding pastor of Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. But there was another man at the church named Lonnie Frisbee. He was the evangelist. I'm told the hippies came because of Lonnie, but they stayed because of Chuck. Lonnie the evangelist, Chuck the teacher, and number three in the big three church makers was John Wimber, the pastor. Now, in my opinion, those three did a great job. They did a great job in equipping the saints for ministry. Calvary Chapel became a mighty fortress worldwide. But soon there was only one, the teacher. The congregation continued to be fed, but the church becomes a classroom. And when the church becomes a classroom, you start calling it a campus. On campus, the classrooms are places to hold audiences for people to, to sit and listen. Listening is necessary, but without the evangelist and, and the pastor, the end is near because we stop going and caring. Now all three are gone at Calvary. Relatives have become rulers. Names are being changed. Splits and splinters are being made. And unless the people make this a new beginning, their end is not near, it's now. But that's them, not us. As we begin listening in Ephesians chapter 4, the seventh verse, if you look there, you'll see a but. Whenever you see a but, it's supposed to stop you causing you to take a second look at that butt. Yeah. I say to all of you, today for sure I'm going to talk about butts. So get ready. <laughs> Starting with, but every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ which he has given us. Which means every one of you believers is gifted not just the big three, yet every church needs all three. First, the evangelist. Now, most churches are content without an evangelist because they make us very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable and, 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 and with all of their energy and all of their urgency. But without them, we just kind of go round and round, never making ends meet. But with the evangelist comes some unqualified qualifications. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. But you be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Now these things you do not learn in seminary. You learn them in church. Otherwise you do not fulfill your ministry as an evangelist. Now keep in mind each and every one of us is to do the work of an evangelist, not just the evangelist. It all starts with being sober. Sober in judgment. 
You cannot be sober in judgment if you're drinking at a sports bar or a sporting event or a wedding or a birthday party. Even though I say it's best not to drink and we have a recovery program to prove it, the average Christian's cup runneth over. Over the speed limit oftentimes and over the legal limit of .08. But the evangelist and those called to be evangelists are to be constrained They're to be constrained by the Word of God and contained by the love of God, not by a 502 in county jail. We're to be watchful, not having to be watched, even though most evangelists are just watched on TV. Because we equate an evangelist evangelist to cool, don't we? Yeah. Fast-talking Bible salesman with pearly white implants. I mean, shiny uh, uh, men's warehouse suits. They got slick back hair and, 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 uh, and shiny black shoes shouting, Hallelujah, glory be God. You know who I'm talking about? Yeah. They never seem to be at a loss for words, raising millions of dollars for themselves and 2.5% for a ministry that cannot be checked in Uganda. If you remember last week, Paul wasn't very cool in Corinth. He said his speaking ability sucked. Maybe he stuttered, maybe he stammered, I don't know. But he got the false teachers to listen, saving the souls of those future seekers to the church and saving the church from total vacancy. That's the kind of evangelist Jesus is talking about. But to be one you have to endure affliction. Remember that darn stake in his side? Now, if the truth were to be known, nobody is enduring much to be in ministry today. The urgency is to get our nails done and get to Starbucks before they close. We are soft. We are soft, and we get our feelings hurt so easy and never lead another person to Christ. The evangelist T.C. Studd once said, you want to live within the sound of a church bell. The evangelist wants to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. With evangelistic ministry comes hardships, comes troubles, comes problems, difficulties, and evils, not just vacation Bible school. You are to do the work of an evangelist, which means as you go, you seek to save the lost. You do that by sharing the love of God and the judgment of God. At the center of your evangelistic mission is reconciling others to Jesus Christ. You're to carry that commission to the end. Not my end, not your end, but to the end of time, amen? Amen. Christ died for you. He died for you believing that you would live for him. Next on your big three church makers is the pastor. Listen to 2 Timothy 4.2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Now the title pastor literally means shepherd. It's kind of funny to me that we attach so much esteem to being a shepherd. When the term in the first century came with it, the same stigma as garbage collector today. People thought a shepherd was dirty and he smelled bad, like you think about a garbage collector today. A shepherd's job was to be up close and personal with their sheep, and these sheep could be nasty. They were mean and often lazy. Now, Here's some sheep trivia and unqualified qualifications for a shepherd that may be more information than you really want. But sheep do not wipe their butts. Feces get lodged in their urine-dried curly wool. Then it's matted and ground into warm wool. The next day, black flies lay maggots all around the sheep's backside. The maggots eat the feces first, and then they go for the flesh, which they like best. Now, it becomes obvious, doesn't it, 
that sheep need a shepherd. The shepherd has to pull back the sheep's unruly wool by hand, then cut it according to the size that is needed, and then quickly let fresh, disease-free wool grow back into that open space. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't think of many pastors who are in the pulpit Sunday after Sunday willing to perform the spiritual equivalent of pastoral care for their flocks. But that's what it takes. That's what it takes with great patience and instruction. I'm coming to my end, which is your beginning. And if you haven't figured it out yet, sheep are high maintenance. They're high maintenance. There are too many preachers masquerading as pastors who are surround themselves with books and not people. They know their Bibles, not their people. I know preachers that know their Bibles, but they don't know where their Bibles are. Yeah. They don't need to. Because they rarely open them. That would mean that they would have to apply the Word of God and it would have to be in season and out of season to reprove and rebuke and, and exhort with patience their people. Now, it's really obvious that preaching is important, but first the people must be prepared by a bodybuilder. Very few pastors get there, which means the end is near. The last of the big three church makers is the teacher. Listen to 2 Timothy 4.3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. On any given Sunday morning, most guys we call pastors bounce up onto the platform with loud applause in designer jeans, untucked shirts, and one earbud in, signaling to all of us it's showtime. And for an hour or so, videos play, surround sound surrounds, a light show on the powerful pulpit of Oz is all you see, making it easy to see their unqualified qualifications. These guys are not evangelists. These guys are not pastors. They are teachers. They don't tend lambs. They don't feed sheep. They don't save souls. They write books. And most of these books are not sound doctrine, although they read like it. They are to-do books. People today will read anything written by a recognizable name as the gospel so that they can form their own religion. They want teachers who will tickle their ears and allow them to live like they desire. That's what Scripture says. Now, the big three church builder, builders, we need them all. We need every one of them, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, to equip us to do the work of ministry. Yeah, amen is right. We need them. We've got to have them. Where are they going to come from? Yeah. Years ago, my family went to Washington, D.C. for vacation, and I remember going to the Washington Monument, and the line seemed like a mile long to take the elevator to the top, but the guide said, there is no waiting to go to the top if you're willing to take the stairs. Willing being the key word. <laughs> Only a handful were willing to take the stairs. The rest were just in it for the ride to the top. Most followers of Jesus have believed that they were in the end times. Not only do I believe it, I believe the end times will be in our time. And when the positions of evangelist, pastor, and teacher are filled in the local church, it won't be enough because we're in the end times. Unless the rest of us realize many of those people, many of those people in those positions are more capable than some of us but none of us as capable as all of us, as all of us, if we're willing to take the stairs. 
Christy and Don are going to come in just a moment or come up now. And I'm asking you just to be still. I'm asking you just to be still and know that that scripture has been around a long time. You've not heard it preached on probably ever before. And you just need to be still and let the Spirit of God speak to you about what position you're going to take as I come to an end and it's your new beginning. Oh, man, be still. right here in your midst. Old man, be still. Old man, be still. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. position are you going to take? The sitting position won't work. Be still. Oh, church, be still. Oh, church, be still. Oh, church, be still. Know that I You know that Jesus Christ is your God, that he shed his blood for the forgiveness of your sins, dying on that cross. They buried him. On the third day, he rose from the grave, defeating death so that you could have life. But life abundantly Abundantly, differently, but you got to know God. And you got to keep that old man still. Listen again. Know that I am God, and he has a plan for your life. And he laid it out in the Great Commission when he said, As you go, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As you go, make disciples. Most of us are caught up in as we go, we need to make money. It's all about our jobs. It's all about our titles. It's all about our parking places and all those kinds of things. When in fact, it's really all about making disciples starting with you. Are you the disciple 
that God has called you to be. I pray that you are. I pray that you would want to become even more of a disciple by getting into his word and being constrained by the love of God and contained by the judgment of God and allowing him to be your God. Join me in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today just still, just still, allowing you to speak to us about something that we probably haven't thought much about. We haven't thought about the new beginning. We just often think think about the end, but there's a new beginning coming our way, and we need evangelists, and we need pastors, and we need teachers, and we know that you're going to supply those to us. Where they come from, we don't know, but we certainly know that there's a number of them sitting right here today. And so I pray that they would have heard from you and will continue to hear from you and will become those people that they need to be, if not in title, in deed, and that they would take on the work of an evangelist, that they would take on the work of a pastor, that they would take on the work of a teacher, and that it wouldn't be the end, but it would be a new beginning in their lives and in the life of this church. I pray it today in Jesus' precious name. Amen.